Hi, so I'm Bruce Fumi, and today is the 24th of June. Now, people tend to trace Great Britain and thence the United Kingdom to James VI, who as a child in 1567 was crowned King of Scots in the church behind me. And then on the death of Elizabeth was crowned King of England in 1603. Now in truth, they should trace it back to his great granddad, James IV, who was crowned King of Scots on this day in Scottish history. And that is what today's episode is about. Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi from Scotland History Tours. If you're interested in the people, events and places in Scottish history and you want some great ideas about places to visit in Scotland, then subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the notification bell. That way you'll be notified every time I make a new YouTube video. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Now, if you haven't been here to Stirling Castle before, then you should come, right? You could easily spend a whole day here, right? But the start of the day or the end of the day would be my advice. It's the best of all the castles to visit in Scotland and it's the birthplace of King James IV. Now, the path to his coronation is quite a story. Do you want to hear it? Now, I'm warning you, in this story, Everybody's called James and there are no commas. So stay alert, control the pauses, save lives. Now, from the outset, James, that is the boy who would become James IV, was special. A comet had appeared in the southern sky for a month before his birth. Now, looking back, you can see it was clearly an omen from the gods in the birth of a great king under whom Scotland would be reborn as the Renaissance transformed Europe. At the time, though, it was a breached birth, cosmologically speaking. Astrologers said that the planets were in the wrong position. Prophecies were discovered of how danger would come to the royal family. And witches warned the father, that is, the current James III at the time, that his downfall would be brought about by the next of kin, his next of kin. Imagine if every time you filled in a form where it says next to kin, you have to put the murderer. So, the future James IV, the baby, grew up never really known why his dad never loved him. Now, I've had people criticise me for talking about kings and queens rather than ordinary people's lives. But anyone with any humanity has to break their heart for this wee boy, surely. See when your dad, James III, calls you his first son, James, but then when his second son, your wee brother, comes along, your dad calls him James too. That'd make you think when you're munching your Cocoa Pops, wouldn't it? At least he always puts you down on forms as the next of kin. Now, Daddy James III, had to find a bride for baby James. And wanting to be, keep good relations with the English, they signed a marriage treaty with Edward IV of England. The only problem was that baby James grew up as England was going through the Wars of the Roses. And every time the English king changed, we James had a new fiance. He had three in all before he reached puberty. What a player. When baby James is six years old, his two uncles start rebellions against Daddy James III. Oh no! He's been worrying about the wrong next to kin all this time! So, rebellious uncle number one dies under suspicious circumstances. It's about time we had a witch burning. Uncle number two was imprisoned in Edinburgh Castle. But he got the guards drunk, escaped, fled to France, and then promised the King of England, who's changed again, by the way, anything that he wanted for help to overthrow his brother. That's how we lost Berwick upon Tweed. It was the last holdout of the Crimean War. If you, if you know about that, then show off by giving a comment down below. <coughs> anyway. Uh, we were talking about uh, dodgy uncle num number two. Eventually, he fled to France and died from a jousting wound, but not before he'd caused a rift between Daddy James III, his wife, the Queen, and poor wee James. Remember wee James, the first 
of two who will become the fourth after the third. Don't worry, you weren't supposed to follow that. I'm just saying that now the king, the queen and their firstborn heir are in a standoff like the closing scenes of the good, the bad and the ugly. James III is a dodgy Mexican guy, by the way. So, we James is now nine years old. His dad still doesn't speak to him, uh, but he does arrange another marriage. And then he leaves him in the care of his mum, the Queen. When we James is 13, his mum dies. Was it poison? Nobody knows. But Daddy James III now leaves him in the care of a guy called Shaw of Sochi. His Christian name? James. By now, if you're not starting to think that James III was a bit of a dick, then I'm not telling the story right. Of course, the people at the time, they didn't need me to tell the story. They knew him by his actions. And loads of the nobility turned against him. He totally mismanaged the situation, including threatening powerful nobles, breaking promises, and trying to get troops from the English king to fight against his own people. I won't bore you with the details here, but the bottom line is it all ended in a standoff on the 11th of June 1488. James III finds himself a few miles from here in a place called Sochiburn, just the other side of Bannockburn, with Robert the Bruce's sword in his hand, a fast horse under his buttocks, and his largely paid troops on one side, and on the other side troops owing allegiance to the son that he's despised and rejected since birth. Now I know what you're thinking, it's not the comet that alienates people, it's bad parenting. Nevertheless, if I was James III and I believed in witches, horoscopes and prophecy, I'd be caking my pants at this point. He must have felt even worse when the battle started to go badly. Not being a man of courage, he fled off on his horse. Now, the story goes that he raced across the Bannock Burn of Robert the Bruce fame. And as he crossed the Bannock Burn, uh, he gave a fright to a wee lassie. She was carrying a clay pot, which she dropped. And when it smashed, it frightened the horse. The horse reared and the king fell from the horse. Now, the local miller brought King James back to his house nearby. And James explains that he's the king and he wants a priest. The miller's wife sets off to look for a priest and she meets a guy who happens to be passing by. Priest, you say? Who's it for? The miller's wife explains that it's the king, right? He comes back to the house, recognises it is the king. He asks the king if he thinks he'll survive. And the king says, oh yes, I will. But I'd still like to see a priest to administer the sacrament. The guy, knowing the king, says, I'll do that. And stabs him in the heart. And he wasn't even next to kin. The next day, James, the actual next of kin, declares himself King James IV. And just under two weeks later, on the 24th of June, the fourth James of Scotland was crowned at Schoon, on this day in Scottish history. Now, we're told that James is instructed that his father wasn't to be harmed in the battle. Nevertheless, for the rest of his life, James wore a heavy iron chain around his waist as a penance for Lent. Or was it Father's Day? Doesn't matter, James was a true Renaissance king with interests in education, science and the arts. He was the first Scottish monarch to require education by law. He was the last Scottish monarch to die in battle. So maybe he paid his penance after all. But he was transformational for Scotland. He was one of the great royal builders. He built the first real navy. But Fulton Palace, Linlithgow Palace, Holyrood Palace all bear the hand of James IV. And here at Stirling Castle, where he was born, he built the great 16th century facade and the great hall still radiates its orange beacon to this day. I know it's not radiated, it's reflected. Check out the video that I did on the physicist James Clark Maxwell, okay? Uh, James of Force buildings are at the core of Stirling Castle and I'm sure I'll come back here and do further episodes here in the future. Uh, but you should go there too. You should also go and see Linlithgow Palace. 
15 years after his coronation, he finally married his English bride. She was Margaret Tudor, the elder sister of Henry VIII of England. And it's this marriage of Tudor and Stuart, Thistle and Rose, that was the root of the United Kingdom. If you come here to Linlithgow Palace, you can climb uh, Queen Margaret's Tower there behind me. It was there that she sat each day watching and waiting for her husband James IV to return from battle against her brother Henry VIII. He never did. But here at Linlithgow Palace, Margaret had given birth to their son, James V. Also here at Linlithgow Palace, James V's wife, Mary de Guise, gave birth to their daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots. And on the death of Elizabeth of England, Mary's son, James VI of Scotland, became James I of England. Now there's so much more to tell about his great granddad James IV and I'm sure I will do it at some point in the future. If you've enjoyed this starter then please like, share, subscribe and click the notification bell to find out about new videos that I put out. Uh, in the meantime, Hamiendoch is going to be a lama alive. Cheerio and Rasta.